new experiments are getting more and more expensive and it takes a longer time uh, to build them. So just, you know, poking in the dark by building experiments, that's not an option anymore. We're, we're way past the stage. There is a cycle where you have the public who has a vested interest in fiduciary responsible people taking care of their, their money, their stewardship of their, of their finances. They also have an interest in the results of the science as much as, you know, we scientists are not great at exposing, you know, what really fascinating work we're working on. Um, and then there's this, you know, kind of hype, you know, mini cycle where, you know, you have your university press office and you've got your, you know, your local newspapers, et cetera, that want to build up the research that's going on. And I just wonder, you know, in an era, since we're experiencing now this great, you know, potentially this great recession or, or whatever might even be worse in this era of a, a declining, you know, budget dollars, um, where do you think people should spend their time? In other words, it's not for lack of brain power. I can point to 20 people working on dark matter and dark energy. Um, what do you think it will really be that, that leads to, you know, the, the most bang for the buck or return on investment, given that we live in a constrained resource environment? In other words, why shouldn't we spend money on COVID research and, and CRISPR and, you know, and devote that to dark matter, you know, discovering aspects of dark matter? Yes, that's exactly the right uh, question to ask. Um, so maybe let me briefly return to something you uh, said earlier. You were mm -hmm. uh, talking about the uh, ser serendipity mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that um, led to many breakthroughs. Uh, this, is, this is another one of uh, the nonsense, nonsense arguments on my list uh, because um, you can make this argument about any experiment. Uh, right? Any experiment that tests something that has previously been untested, you can say, well, you know, we could just be lucky and find something. Mm -hmm. So what you should do in this situation, you should choose that investment that is most likely to give you um, the biggest bang uh, for um, the least amount of bucks, basically. And uh, Collider, this bigger Collider just fares very, very badly because it's uh, a lot of buck and very, very unlikely to do any bang. Mm. Um, and and so what, what you're what you're saying is exactly the right question to ask. Like, where are you most likely uh, to make some breakthrough? Now you say something about you know COVID research and so on. Um, again, if if you want me to um, make any statements about societal relevance, I think I'm really not qualified to do that. Uh, that's a very involved question. I would just vaguely say that uh, whenever you are thinking about science investment, you have to think um, in very, very different time scales. You know, there, there is research that is going to be important right now, like this COVID stuff. Then there's research that's going to be important in the next 10, 20 years, uh, like say anything about um, genetic therapies, what, what have you. Uh, and then there's research that's going to be important in two, three hundred years or something. Mm -hmm. And that's where you can put high energy particle physics or foundations of quantum mechanics and that kind of stuff. And uh, so to have some kind of uh, balanced budget, you should, you should cover all of that mm. um, in, in a certain division. So that, that's the, that's the uh, difficult part to work out. And I'll, I'll, I'll leave that uh, to an uh, economist. Mm -hmm. so, so that's for what the overall societal um, problem is concerned. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. Mm -hmm. So now if, if you look at the foundation of physics specifically, I feel much more qualified uh, to say something. Um, because what I've basically presented in my book is an answer to exactly this question. Like, um, what are the areas that you should be focusing on where you are most likely to make progress? And um, the way that I um, um, present this argument is by looking at the history of physics. Like, you can, you can ask if you look at the history, um, where has progress come from? And so, yes, there has been experimental progress, of course. So there were these discoveries uh, of serendipity. Uh, <laughs> this is a terrible word. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, so, so the, the problem with those is um, that um, new experiments are getting uh, more and more expensive and it takes a longer time uh, to build them. Uh, so just, um, you know, poking in the dark by building experiments, that's not an option anymore. We're, we're way past uh, the stage. Mm -hmm. And this puts a heavy burden on theorists because um, they have to, um, you know, come up with arguments for what's the next experiment that we should be doing. Um, uh, and so that's why theorists have to be really, really careful with um, what 
um, argumentation they uh, rely on. And now um, this brings us to the other type of breakthroughs uh, that we have seen uh, in the foundations of physics, which were those that were led by theoretical predictions. And now it's very interesting if you look at the cases where this has actually happened, it was always by solving an inconsistency in the existing theories. And by this, I mean uh, just a mathematical disagreement. If you think about, um, for example, Einstein's um, uh, you know, special relativity and also general relativity, um, the, the former was an inconsistency between the Galilean invariants and Maxwell's equations. It's just the wrong invariants. Um, and uh, then once you have special relativity, uh, you notice where well, that's actually incompatible with Newtonian gravity. So you have created another uh, inconsistency that requires a solution uh, that brings you to general relativity. And then once you have special relativity, um, uh, you also notice that this didn't fit together with the original formulation of quantum mechanics. And uh, resolving this inconsistency, that's what Dirac did. And so, yes, Dirac was talking a lot about the beauty of his solution, but he also had a really, really good problem to solve in the first place. And uh, so this is, I think, the reason why these mathematical uh, breakthroughs uh, worked, because they had these inconsistencies. And uh, there, there are other examples. For example, the Higgs. Um, the Higgs solves an actual inconsistency. Now, if you look at all the failed predictions in the past 40 years, these were not um, the, um, theoretical predictions that were based on solving an inconsistency. Mm. They were based on wanting to make the theory more beautiful. Mm. And so the answer that I come to uh, towards the end of the book is focus on solving real inconsistencies. If you want to make theoretical progress, that's what you should be doing. And so this returns us to this issue with uh, the question, should we build a larger collider? Um, in this energy range that the next larger collider could be testing, there are no inconsistencies that require a solution. Hmm. And that's, that's a, a situation which is entirely different to the situation for the Large Hadron Collider, where you knew you, ha you have these unitarity problems that required a solution, that, that was an actual inconsistency. So we knew that something had to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily the Higgs, but there had to be some solution to that. So um, we knew that we would see something new. And yeah, well, the Higgs it was. But uh, for the next bigger collider, there just isn't anything re remotely like that. Mm -hmm. The next inconsistency in the standard model is somewhere where um, um, the issue with the neutrino masses becomes relevant. And that's not until... I forget, uh, 10 to the 13 GV or something like that. Mm -hmm. so, so it's way, way off. You're not going to get there. Um, so um, you should be um, focusing then on uh, more promising inconsistencies. You some, something that's uh, closer around the corner. Um, dark matter is like the obvious uh, candidate to name, right? Mm -hmm. um, because in, in that case, okay, so this is not a, a theoretical internal inconsistency, but it's, it's an inconsistency between the theories and um, observations. And in this case, at least we do have observations. <laughs> so we have, we have something to build on. And then um, there are other inconsistencies, like the missing quantization of um, gravity is an actual inconsistency. It doesn't mm -hmm. fit together with the standard model. Um, there's the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. And there are, some, there are other uh, mathematical problems uh, in quantum field theory um, themselves. And now the problem is, this returns me to what I said in the very beginning, um, solving these problems is really, really, really hard. Um, hmm. And so people are not going to do it on a, on a short-term grant um, if they have to produce uh, results quickly. What they will be doing instead is that they will do the easier stuff, hmm. and that's producing these uh, piecemeal, little tiny incremental uh, things that you can publish and you can put on your CV and then you will get a job. 